that okay? No, I'm not. It's okay. Good morning. I am calling to order our regularly scheduled Committee of the Whole uh, meeting for today, April 23rd. My name is Elizabeth Glidden. I am the chair of this committee, and I'm joined today by uh, Council Members um, Gordon, Cano, Reich, Bender, uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, Yang, Warsami, Goodman, Fry and Palmisano, and we are a quorum of the committee. We have one item for discussion on our agenda for today, and this is a presentation on single employer self-insured medical plan. And I'm not positive who is leading off the presentation. Uh, if you want to come forward then, Ms. Traver, introduce yourself and the team that is with you today, and we are ready for you. And uh, just to, you might want to ask someone to help you with, uh, if, if you need help getting that set up. We haven't yet seen it on our screen, and then just so you can make sure you're by the microphones. Okay. Um, good morning, Chair Glidden, Council Members. Um, I'm Joyce Traver, Benefits Manager for the City. With me today is um, Susan Trammell, Assistant City Attorney and Ethics Officer for the City. Katie McGuire from Benefits, um, Jim Michaels, who is a labor rep for police, fire, and public works engineers. Um, Katie will be helping me with the technical portions of our presentation. All right. And thanks for introducing the team. And Okay. Yes. Okay. And the topic today um, is self-insurance for the city of Minneapolis. Um, the agenda, we'll be covering briefly some insurance principles. We'll be reviewing the d discussions that city leadership has had in the past about self-insurance. We'll be also talking about a concept called multiple employer welfare associations, or in the state of Minnesota, self-insurance pools. And we'll also be giving um, the recommendation that it's contained in today's request for council action and a timeline for, um, for these recommendations. Um, currently, uh, there are two basic types of funding mechanisms for all benefit plans, welfare benefit plans. Currently, the city's plan is fully insured, and what that means is the employer pays fixed monthly premiums to an insurance company for each covered employee. Those monthly premiums cover not only the projected claims expense, but they also pay for a standard set of administrative services. The insurance company, under this arrangement, the insurance company assumes the risk of paying claims for covered services, and um, you know, good experience, adverse experience, typically shows up down the line in future um, premium increases. To be self-insured means that the employer assumes more financial risk for providing benefits for the employees. The employer pays a fixed monthly fee um, that covers some administrative services. Typically, they purchase stop-loss insurance. That would be what we'd recommend for the city. And then the employer assumes the risk or pays the actual claims up to these stop loss limits. Um, a self insurance, there are some advantages um, for self insurance. It allows for greater transparency of the actual plan costs. We would know uh, under that arrangement how much of the, our expenses really are comprised for of claims, how much administrative costs we're actually paying for these services that we've contracted for. Um, some of the insurer's um, charges um, are either reduced or eliminated, such things as the charges they make for um, their profits, even though in Minnesota they're really not for profits, they're still paying to, we're still paying to build up their reserves. And um, 
where we would also um, eliminate some taxes and fees. We would eliminate the state taxes, which are approximately 2.5% of an insured premium. We would eliminate some of the taxes that apply under the Affordable Care Act. And that, would, that currently represents approximately 2.4% of premium. It also, self-insurance also allows for greater flexibility in managing plans, benefit plans. We'd have more opportunity to customize plan design, including network um, configuration, and we'd be able to um, purchase best-in-class vendors and services that, that best suit our employee population. Um, as opposed to accepting a standard set of services that come with fully insured plans. Along with those advantages come increased employer responsibilities. The employer becomes responsibility for setting rates, um, for projecting costs, for doing other financial forecasting, um, building up reserves, um, things of that nature. In addition, there are increased legal responsibilities. There's some reporting requirements, um, both from a federal and state standpoint, that typically you would contract with the carrier to provide those services, but ultimately they become the employer's responsibility to make sure that they get done. Um, this may or may not involve additional staffing for the city. There's also a greater risk, well, there's just fluctuating financial results. Under a self-insurance plan, um, your costs are made up of those fixed administrative fees plus claims expenses. Those claims expenses will fluctuate during the year, typically lower at the beginning of the year when, as people are satisfying their deductibles greater at the end of the year. And you would need to align those, your funding arrangements with, um, for claims and those expenses with the city's budgeting and financial reporting um, processes. Um, as I stated, we, city leadership, union leadership, has been studying um, the issue of self-insurance for several years. Most recently, the most recent serious study was in 2013. Um, along with that, at the same time, we were also looking at plan design changes because we know that in order to provide, avoid what's called the excess tax on high cost plans that will become effective, in 2018 under the Health Care Reform Act, health, we will have to keep our premium increases below 5%. So we were looking at plan changes for 2014 based on an initial um, renewal of almost 17%. Um, along with that, that renewal, the fully insured renewal, we got a self-insured quote from Medica that indicated we could save a little shy of $5 million in taxes, assessments, and administrative costs if we went self-insured. At the same time, well, sort of this was all going on at the same time, but we negotiated a some plan changes that increase the deductibles and out-of-pocket limits and reduced that increase to about 3.4%, to exactly 3.4%. This, this actually avoided a cost increase of $5 million for the city. So based on those, those dynamics, the decision was made to accept the fully insured quote for 2014 um, to implement the plan changes and to set the stage for future consideration of self-insurance. What you don't want to do is go self-insured from an employee perspective, go self-insured and make big plan changes at the same time. You want this to be as seamless as possible for your employees. 
which leads us to the next um, issue that we encountered when we were looking at self-insurance. Thank you very much. Ms. Trammell? Chair Glidden, members of the council, Susan Trammell from the city attorney's office. Well, working with the benefits labor management group and the benefits manager and uh, researching the issue of uh, self-insurance, it became apparent that the city, if we were to move to self-insurance, would uh, encounter a concept, what is commonly called a MIWA, a Multiple Employ Employer Welfare Association. That's the term under ERISA plans. And while the city is a governmental entity and therefore not governed by ERISA, the state governs these multiple employer type plans for governmental entities and they call them self-insurance pools. The way the city is currently uh, operates with its benefits plans includes some non-city entities on its health plans. Um, included on the city's health plan are the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, which is a political subdivision of the state and the enabling legislation at the state level specifically identifies that their employees are not city employees. We have the Municipal Building Commission, which is also a political subdivision of the state. It's not the city, it's not the county, it's its own entity. And also the joint, a joint powers board, uh, the youth coordinating board. Again, not a city entity. Um, when you have uh, these employers participating in your group that are beyond the employer control group, when, when we do have some uh, entities like the park board, which is a unique department of the city, but it is a department of the city. That's within our control group. These other entities are outside of the control group. And if we were to continue to allow them to participate in our plans and move towards self-insurance, we would need to take steps to comply with Minnesota's self-insurance pool rules. And those rules are quite onerous and complicated and take away a lot of the advantages that there would exist for moving to self-insurance. First and foremost, um, there would be a board of trustees required to run our benefits plans. The city would get one of the four votes um, related to its decisions regarding rates, benefits, and all other decisions related to the plan. And so that would change drastically how our plans are operated. In addition, we'd have to comply with the rules that exist for self-insurance pools and file all of the organizational documents describing the purpose and the governance and administration. And this, the State Department of Commerce um, controls this process. We'd be required to comply with their rules related to stop loss, both aggregate and individual stop loss insurance. And they have requ certain requirements that they mandate for funding reserves. Uh, they have additional requirements related to asset limitations and annual reporting requirements. And then this, the state can get involved and issue levies if necessary to maintain the plan's financial integrity. And we, again, we would lose some of the benefits of moving to self-insurance because once you have a self-insurance pool, those premium taxes and assessments that we were going to avoid by going to self-insurance would then now apply again. So those are some of the reasons um, that self-insurance pools make a situation of self-insurance not as feasible. In addition, as the plan sponsor of a plan, when the city has non-city entities on its plan, we incur some liability risk for decisions and actions made of these non-city entities over which we have no control. We have certain HIPAA requirements. We have certain reporting and tracking requirements under the Affordable Care Act and certain testing that must be done uh, to satisfy non-discrimination of our plans and all of this um, we don't have control over when it comes to these other entities. So those are some of the reasons um, that the recommendation is coming forward from a legal standpoint. Thank you very much. Okay, so this, 
This brings us to the recommendation that's contained in our request for council action and the accompanying resolution. Um, we are um, requesting that we move forward as a single employer medical plan effective January 15th to provide coverage for city employees and their dependents. Um, furthermore, we're um, requesting approval to proceed with a study on the feasibility of self-insurance for the city, including a release of an RFP for the city's medical plan that request for the RFP will come as a separate action through Ways and Means. Um, we are also, as part of this resolution, committed to work with the Youth Coordinating Board, the Municipal Building Commission, and MPHA to transition the benefit plans and to develop a process to transition payroll services um, when it's appropriate. We have already, um, working with our benefits consultant, received quotes uh, about uh, regarding standalone options for these three plans. Um, those quotes look very favorable. We've met so far with M MBC and MPHA about the process. We are, um, we've um, providing information, we've reaffirmed our commitment to assist these organizations with the process. We have um, put our benefit consultant at their, disposal, at their disposal, given them copies of our RFPs to assist them in this process. And we will work through the steps, the transition steps with them. Well, Ms. Traver, um, I wanted to thank you and, uh, one oh, more one more thing. One more quick. Um, this is the timeline, so April 23rd today, this is what I just um, discussed about our, our recommendation or our request to move forward um, with, to implement the medical plan to study the feasibility of self-insurance. Um, if provided this goes forward, that this will require an amendment to city ordinance. We will also go to the permanent review committee on the 8th to uh, seek approval for the uh, medical plan RFP, um, sort of coincident with the council approval to release it. And during the period May through July, we will study the feasibility of self-insurance as well as review and select a new carrier as appropriate. And in late July, we will come back to City Council with our recommendation regarding self-insurance and um, carrier selection for the plan year that begins on January 1st, 2015. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I wasn't interrupting again. Um, and I did want to say a tremendous thank you to, to you and to Ms. Trammell and to the entire team that I think has done a tremendous amount of research on this uh, option uh, to put together, I think, a, a really good report for us on um, how we might consider moving forward. Um, I want yeah. to allow for questions from council members, but also wanted just to give my colleagues uh, a heads up. I have discussed this with Ms. Traver, and this would not harm the planned timeline, and that is that uh, I'm going to move to postpone this in committee one cycle. It's not because we're receiving new or different information, but it will allow for some just additional one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with our partner organizations, and we want to make sure that we are continuing to, to allow that to happen. And so I just want to thank you for, um, for being able to accommodate that within uh, the timeline. Um, uh, and and uh, Councilmember Gordon has a question, but I might just also um, uh, thank Mr. Michaels uh, for being here and being part of the conversation. And I guess I should just uh, ask, did you want to add anything to the conversation here? or? Um, and Mr. Michaels is yeah. here on behalf of uh, some of the labor groups. 
Thank you, Chair Glidden. Uh, committee members, uh, Jim Michaels, uh, as Joyce mentioned, I'm a, a business a business agent representative for the Police Federation, for the firefighters, and for the Public Works engineers. Um, I've been a member of the Benefits Labor Management Committee since it was uh, formed back in, I think, 2000 or 1999. And um, this moment is something that we've literally been preparing for for almost 10 years in terms of how we've crafted our plan, how we've educated our employees, how we've implemented uh, design changes to the plans, how we've implemented wellness, and it's actually been quite successful in seeing uh, the overall health of our employees increase, our claims experience is trending downward, so now is the perfect time um, to move forward with this. And uh, Susan's done a great job of explaining to you some of the legal hurdles that we need to overcome in order to do this. Um, but we believe even the employees of those organizations will wind up being as good, if not in fact better off, uh, with some of the options that they have before them. So. Um, we just appreciate uh, your time and consideration again, and I'm here just to say that Labor um, has fully collaborated in this and fully supports this effort um, because we see it as the best alternative to be able to continue our mission from our committee, which is to deliver quality health care to our employees, uh, manage costs as, as much as prudently while still providing a safety net from people who suffer serious illness or injury. Um, and uh, again, uh, in consideration of that mission, we believe this is the best alternative moving forward. So thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that might come up as well. All right. Well, thank, thank you for, um, for being here and for sharing that perspective. I know that's important to, uh, to us here to understand what has been the partnership with labor and, and all the stakeholders moving forward. Um, Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate all the information, and uh, I had the opportunity to have a, a briefing, too. I think one of the things that I'm most concerned about is that the uh, um, that there's a smooth transition for uh, all of us and all the employees, and that there isn't any, uh, we don't see any big change in the clinic we can go to or the doctors that we can all see, and that people um, really see the benefits of that. Um, I um, also... Uh, um, very interested in seeing us save some some money um, as a city because I know this is a, a an enormous expense. I guess the one question I have is as we we move forward and we're going to um, study the feasibility of self insurance and we're going to move towards implementing this. Is there a, any chance that we'll have a provider like Medica um, come back and offer us, I mean, is there any chance that we'll reverse course because we'll, we'll, the feasibility doesn't seem to work or will just the idea that we're going to self-insure will motivate insurance co companies to start responding and offering us a better and better um, uh, deal? Ms. Traver. Um, Chair Glidden, Council Member Gordon, um, these things are hard to predict. Um, in the past, I'm, the city of Minneapolis is a marquee client for a lot of businesses, local businesses. In the past, there has been, well, how do I put this? Um, sort of lowballing some of the premiums in order to get the city business, but it usually ends up bubbling up later on because your claims experience does catch up with you. Um, so I, I don't know what will happen. I do know in the past few years we have a mu we've gotten a much better handle on the true costs of claims, kind of the risks of our employees. We're able to predict where some of the large claims will occur. So we're in a much better place to look critically at the proposals we're receiving from these health care carriers. I don't know if this, this wasn't exactly your question, but the intent is not to, if we decide to go forward, if the collective decision is to move forward as self-insurance, that it would not result in disruption for employees, either by changing the plan design or by changing the doctor-patient relationship, that is, that is something that everyone on that 
the group, the Benefit Labor Managed Committee, is very cognizant of is that we um, we not let that happen as part of this process. I don't know if that answered or not. But. No, that was some good reassurance that answered a question I uh, Yes, we have implied. our labor friends who yep. Yep. So I appreciate that. help and us good, make sure that this doesn't It's happen. good to hear that, too. And the last thing that I'm concerned about is just the um, – the partners that have been kind of benefiting by the umbrella of the city, the Youth Coordinating Board, the Building mm -hmm. Commission, and MPHA, the Housing Authority. Um, and I know they need to, at least I talked a little bit with the Youth Coordinating Board, I mean, and they, with the understanding that they're going to get help so that they can land in a better place, they mm -hmm. seem uh, interested in having these discussions. But um, I can appreciate what a... Um, a great benefit to those people it's been to be under the umbrella of the city up until now and so I think we because we kind of took on that responsibility we do owe them something to make sure that the transition works out well and that they indeed have a good um, in, you know, health insurance on the other side of this so I uh, appreciate if, if we need to slow it down a little and that's not going to throw the plan off that we um, we can do that to make sure that we have them all on on board Councilmember Palmisano. Thank you, Chair Glidden. Um, I just wanted to express some of the things that came up in our own conversation mm -hmm. about self-insurance to my colleagues. Um, first, I do think our partner organizations will be will likely see the benefit of using the exchange or some of the other options available to them. Um, I personally worked on PPACA for the last three years, and I know that there are um, they will probably potentially see better benefits there and lower premiums than they see right now uh, as part of our plan. Um, second, I want to just point out that the cost savings in here of almost $5 million is probably not that much once the organization, the city enterprise, decides what level of risk we want to take and we do that reinsurance or stop-loss insurance. Um, but nonetheless, this is definitely... I think going to give our city a, a financial benefit to moving to self-insurance. Um, the the thing I wanted to point out um, is that increasing our plan deductibles is a big plan change. That is a big plan benefit design change. It doesn't help a population stay healthy. Um, it, it helps them put off care for ongoing needs, and that's something that we've seen over time. Is in not changing our our plan design or our premium too much. Um, we've accepted a huge increase in deductible, and I hope that that is able to change and shift as we move to self-insurance. Um, I also had spoken about, and I hope we take a look at the need for performance guarantees. That's something that we get as a city when we do self-insurance. Um, I'd be interested in looking at alternative funding arrangements, retrospective claims analysis, and I know from just speaking um, with Sue Trammell and, and yourself um, that we've done a lot of looking at that and that this is built off of that retrospective claims analysis. So that gives me great confidence. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council President Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just um, I, I think it's important to note um, that uh, the county did this a couple years ago. And um, in conversations with um, Commissioner Opeth, they feel that it's working very well. Um, they uh, experienced a, a decrease in costs. And, you know, I think, Councilmember Palmasano, you're absolutely right. You know, this is not going to be the initial savings. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to incur uh, other costs in this. But um, I really want to thank our benefits staff and the, labor ma and the Benefits Labor Management Committee for just this in-depth work that they've done uh, around this issue over several years, as Mr. Michael said. Um, it, it is um, a changing uh, marketplace. Um, being able to take advantage of the Affordable Care Act um, is is uh, a wonderful thing for us and for the, the partners that are under our umbrella now. Um, and I just think it's it is time for us to look at this um, very very seriously and do it in conjunction with those um, folks that have that have benefited from the association with us and and transition them as Ms. Traver said um, to 
um, uh, perhaps a more independent status than they had before. But um, I think we have the capacity to do that and commitment to do that. Um, so I want to reassure those partners that we'll continue to, to work with them to make sure that the transition goes smoothly. But again, thank you so much for this work. And it is um, something that uh, I think the Benefits Labor Management Committee is, you know, probably we've been holding them back a little bit and um, it's, it's time to do this. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for the questions and comments. As uh, you know, often happens, someone else makes your 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 comment or your question. So I really don't have anything more to add, other than again, thank you for what I know has just been a tremendous amount of work to tee up this uh, major decision before us. And I think of you, as you have heard from the comments, there's a lot of positive reception here to moving forward. I am going to move to postpone again. This is uh, to allow for some of these partner conversations that were also referred to by Councilmember Gordon. It's not that those haven't been happening, but we want to allow just some, some final meetings to happen um, before our action. So I will move to postpone uh, this action in committee for one cycle. Discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion uh, has been approved. So thank you again very much. You're welcome, and thank you all for your time, for your consideration, for taking time out of your busy schedules to meet with us about this, what we think is a very important issue for the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. We uh, now are going to turn to reports of committees, and the first is the report from the Community Development and Regulatory Services Committee. With that, Chair, uh, Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. We have 15 items in front of us for approval tomorrow. Items number one and two are recommendations to revoke rental licenses. Items, item number three is refinancing some bonds for the Minnesota Friends School. Item four is the regular liquor, gambling, and business license applications. Item number six um, is a settlement conference issue. Item set, uh, five is a settlement conference issue. So is six. Um, seven and eight are waiving the 60-day requirement to declare a property a nuisance in favor of demolition because of two fires. Most of you have heard about these fires in the um, news. Item number nine is changing some program guidelines for Grow North to make it easier for folks to use that program. Item 10 is the TOD, Hennepin County TOD applications. Item 11 is the TIF plan and consolidated plan changes for the DC group expansion. Item 12 is putting together the resolution for the plan to talk about Lake and Nicollet. Essentially, I won't call it the Kmart site, but the Kmart site, for those of you who are unaware of what I'm talking about. Item number 13 is the Met Council LCDA and TOD grant applications. 14 is the Spring Environmental Grant funding applications. And 15 is our Green Homes North Round 3 funding awards. You saw that recently. We had to make a quick change as a result of a change in the Family Housing Fund allocation. Um, I will have a substitute report on one of the items which just changed the rankings. That's for Hennepin County TOD. I also want to note, Madam Chair, that in the next committee meeting, which is Tuesday, likely time certain around 2.30, we're going to be having a public hearing on the issue of ride sharing. And so we'll probably have a big crowd to come talk to us about um, what the city should do as it pertains to the future of Uber, Lyft, and taxi cabs in the city. I would invite everyone to attend that hearing. Uh, with that, I'll answer questions on items 1 through 15 for approval tomorrow. All right. Thank you for that report, Councilmember Goodman. Um, next, we have health, environment, and community engagement with that committee's chair, Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. The Health, Environment, and Community Engagement Committee will be bringing six items forward for approval. Um, the last four also went through the Ways and Means Committee. Um, the first one is uh, adopting a long-term goal to reduce community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the goal that we approved is reducing emissions by 80% or more by 2050 from the, the 2006 levels. This is actually consistent with the uh, the state goal as well. The second item is 
um, amending the delegation agreement with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture relating to food inspections. There was some confusion about whether the state was responsible for um, inspecting um, milk products, uh, the, the manufacturing and distribution of ice cream and certain foods, and these amendments will clarify that they are and the city doesn't have that responsibility. The third item is authorizing a grant agreement uh, with the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. The fourth is accepting a three-year federal grant um, in the amount of $871 uh, plus dollars to study the benefits of a father advocates program. Quite a, a significant grant in a research project. There were only four awarded in the country, and most of them went to universities, but our health department got this one to conduct a study. The fifth is uh, accepting uh, $40,000 uh, to work on garden and uh, or as an award for garden and green spaces. And the, the final one is authorizing an amendment to the contract with our Blue Sky Veterinarian Services to extend uh, the current lease for the use of laboratory and parking spaces at Minneapolis Animal Care and Control so that they can provide services um, for our uh, city. I can stand for questions. All right, thank you, Council Member Gordon. Um, next, we have the report of intergovernmental relations, and I will give that report as the chair. And we just have one item. It's actually a joint report with the Zoning and Planning Committee to authorize staff to provide comments on Thrive MSP 2040 um, to the Met Council. And seeing no questions on that, next we have the report of Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Emergency Management with that committee's chair, Council Member Yang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have two items for approval, um, both um, acceptance of grant awards, one uh, for the Financial Crimes Task Force, uh, and two is for the Coverdale Forensic Science Improvement Program. And with that, I can stand for questions. I am not seeing any. Next, we have Transportation and Public Works with that committee's chair, Councilmember Reich. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Transportation Public Works Committee for nine items uh, for the full council's consideration. Item one is the 40th Street East West Street resurfacing project. Item two is the Bluff Street Trail Agreement. Item three is the Street re re Resurfacing Special Assessment Correction. Item four regards the Signal Retiming Project. The following items referred reports to Ways and Means Committee. Uh, the Lowry Hill East Area Street Resurfacing Project. Item six is the St. Anthony Parkway Bridge project, specifically the California Street Northeast and Main Street Northeast reconstruction projects associated with that overall bridge reconstruction. Uh, item seven is the Central Corridor LRT project, and that's an agreement uh, with Metro uh, Metropolitan Council for replacement uh, lighting service cabinet uh, agreement for the uh, Central Corridor LRT West Bank area. Item eight is the Johnson Street Northeast, 10th Street, and 11th Street Southeast Street resurfacing projects, and the action there will be to cancel that project uh, due to jurisdictional uh, clarification. And item nine is a, a, low, a low bid from A&M Construction Incorporated for exterior masonry stabilization project phase three. I'll entertain questions. All right, thank you, Councilmember Reich. I'm not seeing questions there. Next, we have the report of the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, as Councilmember Quincy was unable to attend this meeting, he asked me to give that report. Um, there are nine items on the agenda for tomorrow. First, uh, we ha uh, will be authorizing two legal settlements. Um, item number two is uh, acceptance of a gift uh, for our staff to serve as a reviewer for the fourth round of innovation grants by accepting a gift of travel to Art Place America. Item number three is executing a contract with an artist for the Creative City Challenge project, uh, which is going to uh, be presented in, in the summer of uh, this summer, 2014. Uh, the Minneapolis Convention Center Plaza. Item number four is a resolution uh, appropriating funds and authorizing payment of the 1% uh, city lodging tax to Minneapolis. Item number five is amending a contract regarding snow plowing and removal uh, service, which is an increase uh, by $300,000 um, for, uh, for those services. Item number six is uh, accepting a low bid regarding wall fabric replacement. Uh, this is for the Minneapolis Convention Center. 
Item number seven is to accept the single bed of uh, Tyson Krupp elevator to uh, furnish and deliver all labor and materials regarding elevator work at the Visitor Information Center at the Minneapolis Convention Center. Item number eight is approving an appointment to the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee of Lindsay Wolschlager. Um, and item number nine is to amend a contract with the Regents of the University of Minnesota to accept revenue for additional license configuration support for our computer-aided dispatch system um, and to increase our revenue and expenditure budget to accommodate that. I will note and uh, I will say uh, Councilmember Kunz was very insistent that I make sure that I alert folks that we will have some up coming finance presentations that everyone is invited to in the Ways and Means Committee. On May 5th, there will be a presentation on property taxes. And May uh, 19th, there is a presentation on city expenditures. And the presentation that happened at this cycle's Ways and Means Committee on revenues is available online, as well as some corresponding resources for those who'd like to review those materials. Next, we have the report to the Zoning and Planning Committee um, with that committee's chair, Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have two items from Zoning and Planning this cycle. The first is regarding 2320 Colfax Avenue South, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I know this has been a, an item of much discussion. And then the second is the passage of a resolution um, approving a corrective, corrected vacation resolution um, for a parcel on the blocks bounded by Lindell Avenue South, 29th Street West, Lake Street West, and Aldrich Avenue South. Um, so the first item was uh, a, an appeal filed by Michael Crow. He had submitted a demolition of historic resource application, um, and notwithstanding staff recommendation, the HPC denied that uh, demolition permit, and that came to my committee um, where the committee overturned that decision. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about this. I want to just give a brief overview of the questions here. Um, so this, the questions here are, um, does this building meet our historic preservation criteria? And then second, is there a reasonable alternative to its use? Um, so one could vote to, and this is what staff said, uh, one could vote to allow the demolition simply based on the finding that this building does not recreate meet the required standards of our historic preservation ordinance. It's been studied four times. Uh, two times it has been studied as part of open-ended surveys of historic resources in the area, and twice it was excluded, although properties across the street were included. Um, two more times our staff found that it was, did not meet, retain, retain its integrity after three fires and significant modifications. Uh, the Secretary of Interior requires that findings be based on the building's existing condition and not its future potential. This was uh, ignored by the HPC. In fact, one of the commissioners said during the discussion, uh, quote, I've been told previously that I go beyond our charter too much. Okay, I'm guilty of that. And I think that um, sort of blatant disregard for the um, legal framework that we're operating in is troubling. Um, if you choose to ignore or disagree with staff's findings of the building's integrity, then the question becomes, is there reasonable alternatives to demolition? Um, so what's reasonable in this case? Is it reasonable to legally mandate that someone continue to operate a boarding house, which is no longer a legal use in the city? Or is it reasonable to legally mandate that this be returned to a single family home in an area that's zoned R6 in a transit rich part of the city that is surrounded by apartments? What is reasonable? Uh, I know you've heard a lot of arguments about this building, so I wanted to address some of those issues. Um, sometimes the activists say that this is about equity for the residents of the build boarding house, but then they turn around and say that the owner should accept a below market offer so that a reality TV, shows, TV show host can restore this to a single family home. Um, so I don't think it's really about equity. Um, although that's very important to me. Sometimes we hear that the property owner is lying about offers for the property. And I think this is, I mean, I think our attorneys would say that that's irrelevant to the question of historic integrity. Um, if you're looking at what's reasonably um, legal for us to mandate as a city council, I would ask, you know, when are we, should we as a city council, when should the government require someone to take a lower offer for their own private property? Um, I've heard that this building should be um, nominated for an historic designation study. Um, that could have been done any time in the last um, couple of years, but it was not. I imagine that's because it's been studied over and over, and the um, answer keeps coming up the same, that it does not retain its integrity. Uh, we're hearing about environmental concerns. Those are completely irrelevant to the legal questions before us. Uh, even that, though, I would still argue that, um, as we did when we were talking about the Metropolitan Council's 2040 plan uh, the other day at a couple of our committees, that growth within the city um, is more sustainable than exurban sprawl. 
So I just wanted to um, make those points because I know you're hearing from a lot of people. Many of them don't even live in the state of Minnesota, much less in my community. I live just down the street from here. I've been hearing from a lot of my neighbors, and they are not professional activists. They don't know they're supposed to email every single council member in order to amplify their voice. They don't have a TV show host um, you know, drumming up support for their perspective. But um, one neighbor who lives down the street wrote to me, and he said, six years ago, I bought a boarding house, and I renovated it into my family's home. My wife and I are architects. We had the vision and resources to do so. It was a great decision, and it will be our long-term home. That said, I am not in favor of preserving every structure for preservation's sake. After reading the staff reports and the minutes from meetings over the last year, I believe that the actions taken were not based on fact, but upon the desires of a vocal minority aligned with your predecessor. Again, these people don't have professional um, TV hosts or activists on their corner, but they voted for me, and I'm here to represent them. Uh, so I uh, wanted to um, you know, put some of those um, responses out there to, I know, a lot of the um, things you've been hear hearing as you're uh, strongly lobbied on this issue. Thank you. I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I wasn't going to say anything, um, but now I'm going to because I actually uh, think that this is a issue that reasonable people could come down on either side of. And there have been reasonable people on the council who have had my position. I'll note in 2013, all 13 of us had the reasonable position that this house should be saved and studied. And now there's been one big change, and that's an election. And as a result of the change in the election, it seems like the House has been put in a situation where its fate is moving in a different direction. Um, I will note that the criteria we need to look at are, is there a health, life, and safety issue, or is there a reasonable alternative? And there is a reasonable alternative. It's an alternative that Mr. Crow doesn't want to take. Why would he? If he can get more money from a developer to build something bigger and more dense, of course he would choose that over um, a offer from someone who would want to rehab the house and potentially turn it into a single family home, but it potentially could be turned into condos and there could be four units. It potentially could be turned into apartments and there could be eight units. Um, I, I think uh, it is not never a good idea to demonize either side of the debate. There are prominent people on both sides of it and preservation is an issue probably like animals that draws a lot of emotion and people just feel terrible when they see their community, their neighborhoods, their city's history demolished right in front of them. And so to say that there's some sort of celebutant HGTV person who wants to take this issue on and make that a negative, it's been my experience that that's been a positive. I think Ms. Curtis has worked on several houses in our city, some in South and some in North of Minneapolis, that were literally on the brink of falling down themselves. The one on Hillside is one that I think we would have torn down ourselves, but for them coming forward and trying to make that change. So I don't think it makes any legitimate sense to demonize people on either side of this. Uh, I don't condone the behavior of people who have criticized Councilmember Bender. I don't criticize her for her opinion. That's her opinion. She won an election. She's entitled to it. But the people on the other side of it have incredible passion and emotion too. And some who have contacted me don't live here, but a lot do live here. And a lot live on this block and a lot live in this neighborhood. And their fear, not only about this house, is that there'll be the next one and the next one and the next one. And that we have a council have decided that density is more important than preservation. So this issue is kind of being held up as an example of what the council stands for, and it's going to be a very loud message to the public that we think density is more important than preserving historic structures. And I really wish that would not be the case. In my ward, we have a lot of projects that are very dense that are happening by Lake Calhoun, in Loring Park, in the downtown area. This is not about being anti-density. I don't know anything about Mr. Landel's, Lander's proposal. I don't really care. To me, it has to do with the house itself and whether or not it meets this criteria that there's an alternative that is reasonable. And in this case, there is a reasonable alternative. Um, Mr. Crow chooses not to take it. And unfortunately, if this house were six blocks away in Lowry Hill, this conversation would never be happening. Not because the people there like their houses more, just to clarify that, but because the zoning protects R1, R2, single family structures. This area has been rezoned multiple times to high density, and as a result, all of these homes 
potentially are in danger of some next person saying, well, I have a Healy house too, and I'm down the block, but you did this for Michael Crow, so you should do this for us too, and the council member supports it, so they're all sitting there thinking about how that block of Colfax, or maybe DuPont, is going to change over time. And it's not that density is bad, it's that single family homes to people hold a special place in their hearts. And we have to acknowledge that um, neither side is bad, both sides have very high emotion, and there is a legitimate course we could take to preserve this house. The Preservation Commission has taken that course, and unless they've acted illegally, I would suggest that other people have looked at this and came up with a different conclusion. There are people everywhere on both sides of this. So I would just urge us to help reduce the rhetoric on this issue, move forward with whatever decision you're going to make, and pray that we don't have this in front of us six more times because we see this being the basis for a number of problems going forward. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much and I appreciate people being willing to talk about this uh, uh, today. I uh, no longer serve on zoning and planning committee but I did at one time when we uh, looked at this property and uh, I was interested in seeing if it could be saved um, and so uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough decision to look at it now. And it's always a tough decision when the staff comes in recommending one thing and then the HBC recommends another thing and there's such a division about all of this. Um, I really wish that somebody had uh, done the designation study and it had gotten nominated and we aren't stuck here all the time. And, I, and, and that makes it particularly challenging. So I'm digging through looking at the staff report and trying to pay attention to some of the um, uh, some of the emails that are, are pouring in about it and, and sorting that stuff out um, and also um, talking with the city attorney to figure out what the uh, the real basis is of our decision here. I don't think that this is one of the um, highest properties that we need to be preserving and I do worry that these kind of discussions will actually distract us from taking the time to carefully think about um, what we want to do to preserve um, other properties in the city and other areas. Um, I don't think it's uh, fair or reasonable to say <laughs> that any of us are up here, and, and I'm not certainly are extremists on some side or the other, that either you um, want to welcome more people and more density in the city or you don't. And if, if you happen to uh, want to preserve this, this, this house and even if, if um, you just want to preserve it, but you realize you don't have a legal basis to vote to preserve it, somehow that means that you're, you don't want to um, add density where it should go. So I appreciate uh, the council member Goodman kind of raises that issue because I think all of us in the city, there's parts of the city that we represent that are treasures, that are areas we want to preserve and keep and protect. And then there's other areas where we want to see improvements made and there's better uses and, and we're looking where to put that density and welcome it in there. Um, so uh, I, uh, I think reasonable people can and do and are disagreeing about this and um, I'll be doing my best to get some more information before uh, we take the vote tomorrow. I, I do understand the committee was um, a, a pretty large majority um, supported uh, the demolition. Was it a five to one? Um, maybe a <laughs> council member Bender can answer. Is that right? Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, council member Gordon. Yes, that's right. Five to one. And the HPC was also um, divided on this, I think more divided than previously. It looked like it had been, uh, uh, last time they looked at this, it was eight to two to uh, um, hold off demolition and go ahead with the study, but it was five to three vote at this time. Does that, is that right? Yep, that's correct. It was five to three. And many of the folks who voted in favor cited the potential of the property in the future. There are, many of them are architects who restore properties. Okay, thank you very much. Councilmember Yang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a short question for Councilmember Bender, Chair of uh, ZMP. Um, you know, with regards to this offer from uh, Nicole Curtis of $400,000, um, when was this made? I believe that was made yesterday. Just yesterday, okay. That was my understanding. Anything else? Councilmember Yang? Yes. Okay. Councilmember Gordon. 
So I just want to put this out there because I think this is really where uh, the issue is for me is that certain people when they own a piece of property they assume they have some rights and indeed they do have some rights granted to them to be able to do something with their property. And I think that's where the, 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 the difficulty comes for me. What is the authority that we actually have to walk in and say you have to do this or you have to do that and you have to do this and that. And I think that that's where we are and this is a lot of a lot of where we are, not a, property rights, but also personal rights. But this is what we have to do kind of as a government body is we have to balance those. Because certainly this person could choose to restore this. They could choose to sell it to who, who they want to and all of these things. And um, sometimes there's a real challenge when um, how do you balance those property rights with um, what authority we might have and what is for the greater good. Um, and I do think... Um, there are a lot of rights that there still go with this property and the owner that, that we don't really can't justify um, stepping on. Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to the point of the surrounding area, I just do want to know that there is a potential historic district. Um, it could have been nominated at any time for a designation study, and it hasn't been yet. Um, in the few months that I've been here, I've been reaching out to the neighbors who live in that area um, to hopefully build support for nominating that historic district. Um, as Councilmember Gordon notes and knows very well from his experience in one of his neighborhoods, um, historic districts do take away property rights. And if there isn't, I think, careful outreach to all of the property owners ahead of time, um, it can sometimes backfire. I know that happened. Um, but I think there are also a lot of significant benefits to being in an historic district. So I've started those conversations. And um, I think this is really about balance. It's about saving the properties that have been time and time again identified as the real historic treasures in our city. Um, so I uh, do want to note that I'm very supportive of creating the um, Lowry Hill East um, Historic District. Councilmember Goodman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, ju I just want to note that when Councilmember Yang asked his question of Councilmember Bender, I don't think that that answer is completely correct. And Ms. Curtis is in the audience, and you can ask her. Um, they made an offer on the House over a year ago. It was re-offered yesterday but they had made an offer over a year ago. So this has been, they've been making attempts to try to purchase the house. Um, but I think Mr. Crow was trying to figure out what the political reality was going to be before he made a decision about accepting the offer or not. Okay. Thank you. Fair enough. I'm not seeing any further discussion on this item. Um, so next we have uh, one announcement and that is uh, that following our meeting of uh, April 25th, we will adjourn to room 315 for a closed council session to consider the following matter, which is Avery versus Edwards. And uh, I believe with that, we have dispensed with our agenda for, uh, for this meeting. For this meeting, <laughs> we are adjourning and then uh, uh, reconvening as the as the elections committee, uh, we I'm just going to kind of take a temperature. Would folks like a five minute break, or should we go right into elections committee? I'm getting a couple requests for a five minute recess, so uh, we are adjourned, and we'll be called to order shortly by Councilmember Fry. <laughs>